So this is rolling, this is rolling, this is rolling, this is rolling. So, Conrad Pope interview part one, the childhood. And every day before I go to work, I go to work, God, that's, <laughs> I'm, yeah, that's what school was for me. Before I go to school, I must say that one of the movies that uh, stood out was uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. What do you think, like? Got to check this Ravel guy out, you know. Talks about them going up to uh, see to Stravinsky's house. If you look at the, uh, the, the birth date of, of Louis Armstrong and then the day he died. <laughs> this is kind of the most interesting period in, Amer in American history, yeah. musically. Yeah, no. Master camera, yeah. master shot. It's quite, quite a setup. Today we receive Conrad Pope, one of the most brilliant arranger and orchestrator on this planet. Who happens also to be a great composer and conductor and a fun human being too. He has been working for the last 40 years in Hollywood for nearly everyone, at least once, as he jokes about. For composers such as Oscar winning John Williams on Steven Spielberg and George Lucas movies, Danny Elfman on Tim Burton's movies, Alan Silvestri, Hans Zimmer, and even the late James Horner. Please consider to subscribe to this YouTube channel to be sure to receive the next video and also to help a little bit the YouTube algorithm to suggest and share this video for other people who might be interested in this kind of content. In the meantime, this is part one of Conrad Pope interview, The Childhood. Hello everyone, this is Jean-Stéphane. I'm very happy to welcome you on this YouTube channel dedicated to all the musicians working in this crazy business of film music and the music industry in general. Today, I'm very happy to welcome this channel, Conrad Pope, the one and only. In this video, we will focus more about your childhood. So first question, where were you born? And are you coming from a family of musicians? I was born here in California, originally. And uh, there were no professional musicians in my family. Uh, there were a number of amateur musicians. But uh, music wasn't particularly a, a central thing in my, my family. Um, I was an only child, and I was uh, so my, my parents, my grandmother lived with us, my uh, maternal grandmother, and she was the source of uh, most of the indulgences with music when I was a kid. Uh, like most children, I just began singing, and like most uh, kids, I would say of my age, and the class. Uh, my first experiences of music that I could remember were in the movies in which I was told I was regale people from quite a young age with various little tunes. Do you remember your the well, movies? No, I, I remember, I, I just remember my parents. I, 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 I must say that one of the movies that uh, stood out when I was pretty young, but I must have seen it like a couple of years after it came out, but I was still pretty young. Uh, was a journey to the center of the earth. Ah, 1959, Nine. Bernard Herrmann. That's right. And so uh, I was just barely uh, old enough to be conscious of it. But that said, uh, I'd been in music by that time. I'd also, it's my, my grandmother got me a little violin, which I busted in frustration, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and that sort of, I was always going in and out of music. And I started getting lessons, I guess, on and off when I was around seven, perhaps, six or seven. Uh, but my grandmother paid for them and uh, financed them. So back then, you didn't know you wanted to be a musician? I don't, it was, yeah, it was a, an escape. I was an only child. We moved a great deal. My father was, um, was in the military, actually. And so we moved everywhere around the United States. And my father was uh, stationed in various places all over the uh, wherever America was in conflict, um, for some reason my father found himself there. And so we moved around the United States and it was my one constant friend. And uh, I, in elementary school I probably went to uh, seven different grades or during the first six, seven different schools. Wow. But the only constant was kind of the music and as an only child it was something I could do by myself. And it was kind of... Um, it was a companion. Yes. So back then, when you were a child, you were listening to classical music or 
jazz music? Or no, it's li well. I was listening to mainly the pop music at the time. At, well, sure, there was probably it was impossible to avoid. You turn on the television set, and and there would be Elvis or the Beatles or something. And um, so pop music was part of, of everything. I would say I primarily uh, started listening. My my parents uh, were not fond of buying records. Uh, so my first exposure to music was uh, some records, I guess, and some of the classics, maybe, that they would have, like in supermarkets or something. They would yeah. have these little records of the great classics. But it was primarily um, my my first lessons were Bach, and um, and I my first piano teacher uh, didn't believe in these method books, and she thought that you could start off with the little preludes and fugues and these little things. And so, in any case, that's and so the childhood. Went through that, and I, I like most people, I went to school. Uh, though probably by the time I was in sixth grade, I had some sort of um, idea that I wanted to be in music, and I sort of studied so that that would happen. Okay. And uh, and so my goals uh, were always formed by music. Uh, in after after I, I guess I was ten or so. Yeah. So d when you were ten or so. Did you compose things or you arrange things? Or? I, I tried. I, I started uh, trying to notate things down. Yeah. Tried to figure out how things sounded, what that was that you would listen to. So was it like pop tunes or? Yeah, it'd be pop tunes. It'd be classical stuff. It'd be listen to the radio. It'd be opera. Uh, like I've said, I, my second set of parents. I always say that. Um, I had the, my family at home, and then uh, I always went to the library, a kind of odd thing, because there were so many books there that one could access. Uh, Russ Garcia, I remember the Russ Garcia book uh, when I was probably in middle school, about seventh or eighth grade. And so Russ Garcia, uh, and I, that was my first, quote, orchestration book, as well as Rimsky-Korsakoff, which meant... Uh, I read, though it meant absolutely nothing to me, because in the days that I had that, uh, you couldn't go off and get uh, the, the golden cockerel or something and listen to it. And so I was always faced with these scores that yeah, I would sure. try to <laughs> play through and get some idea, but I had no idea. And even then, I, I still say, it's the best orchestration book if you've already suffered with the orchestra and learned your lessons firsthand, then you can appreciate the wisdom of the book. Otherwise, it's a bunch of formulas that you go, really, you can't put this with that? So back then, you you looked at this uh, Rimsky-Korsakov book, but did you look as well as full scores in the library? Oh, sure, no, there were there were things, I still have some in there, I think, of, um, <laughs> in America, one of the great benefits of uh, having won uh, uh, the Second World War was that these GIs went in and uh, took pictures of all the bright Kaufman Hertel music, and suddenly it all appeared in these these things that were teaching us how to be uh, school musicians. They, you'd have these uh, the, the the symphonies of Beethoven with these arrows that say first theme, second theme, introduction, blah 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 blah, and then it would be all this form that you could go and easily buy for, for, for very cheap. And so I would get my little recordings. And you have to realize this was also in the time when every Sunday, not every Sunday, but I forget what the, uh, what the frequency was, but there would be Leonard Bernstein and the Young People's Concerts. And so oh, yes. I, I'm, a, I'm of that uh, generation. I mean, we could get sidetracked because you might want to know that the most uh, culturally literate time in American Music was the 30s and the 40s because that was when radio was trying thought was trying to wait like, well we can edify the public so therefore let's have, let's have the I, I forget if it was the Red NBC channel I think the Red NBC channel was uh, uh, commercial and had comedy and these kinds of things, and there was the blue NBC channel that had. Toscanini and the NBC Symphony and these edifying concerts of, of everything that, because they were just going, you might have to know this. Um, America was sort of on a cultural jag, if you will. Yeah. Copland was as well doing things uh, and books. Oh, Copland, well, yeah, and well, uh, look, I think that the most creative time in American music is, uh, if you look at the uh, the birth date of, of Louis Armstrong yes. and then the day he died. Ah, uh, yes, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> this is this is guy, history. This, <laughs> this is kind of the most interesting period in Amer in American history. Yeah, musically. Yeah, between Copeland, yeah. Oh yeah, you know between yeah between uh, Copeland and and then and Ellington. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then uh, yeah, sure, Glenn yeah. Miller, and oh, then yeah. John Coltrane, and just Frank Sinatra, this, Billy May, Nelson Riddle, all these guys. Yeah. And these guys inventing this sort of harmonic language, and like Nan would probably tell you, like all the guys sitting around, uh, like her father was playing with the Miller band, would sit there and go like, "Got to check this Ravel guy out," <laughs> you know. This uh, we got, and so they would just die. And even uh, Ted Nash, he has this book out, who was a uh, is the brother of Dick Nash. Talks about them going up to uh, see to Stravinsky's house. Yeah, I true because he. Yeah, he yeah, yeah we're in Hollywood and uh, sort of sitting there saying like, "Wow, you know, uh, could you talk about Firebird?" And he was going like, "No, I'd rather talk about jazz." And uh, <laughs> and so uh, it, these were heady times. And um, so I had private lessons, and then in school they had. Um, in those days, you could start an orchestra instrument in elementary school. And in public school, you could play through a dump, bunch of instruments. And so I basically had my kind of private lessons. And then in uh, public school, I took advantage of learning a number of instruments. I learned uh, because I did not know I wanted to be a composer, probably by middle school, because I'd started trying to write things okay. down. Um, very bad ideas. Yeah. Do you still have these uh, things? Or? No, my parents actually, in one of their moves, um, they moved a great deal. My father was a bit of a gypsy and a uh, vagabond. And uh, during one of their, one of their moves, they, they informed me that, um, you know, I had like 150 compositions before I went to um, the New England Conservatory. And my parents informed me, uh, we dumped them. They're gone. Ah, like the MGM scores? Like but, but yeah, well, <laughs> and, and, it's a, and it's of no interest. It's like most people's juvenilia, I'd imagine. Yeah. But it was a, of interest to me because of um, I, I started to try to engage music, actually, by trying to write it and hear it, and uh, as well as perform it. And so most of my, uh, I guess that I was very conservatively raised because most of what I knew about the literature was basically based on piano literature, which with the, the teachers I had, uh, particularly one, uh, basically didn't go beyond Brahms, more oh, or less. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, when I remember quite distinctly, I guess it was in eighth grade when I became uh, acquainted with uh, Daphne and Chloe, uh, Debussy, Stravinsky, and this sort of changed my life, and though maybe it's even earlier, because I remember in, in, in seventh grade they had the complete works of Arnold Schoenberg, and every day before I go to work, I go to work. God, that's <laughs> yeah, that's what school was for me. Before I go to school, um, <clears throat> I'd listen to Herzegovica, okay. because I just couldn't believe this impossibly high note that their soprano had, and, and it's sort of odd way of how all these odd instruments came together with all these very odd notes. And you listen to Ferkler Tonart? No, well? sure, no, and I listen to everything. I, I made a uh, deployment. leader, all these things? All these things, uh, sure, because I, I, it was my intention to go to music school. Okay, so great transition. So in the next video, we will focus more on your studies. Voila, this is part one of Conrad Pope interview. While I am editing part two of this interview, Please consider to subscribe to this YouTube channel, like, comment, share, you know the thing. This is Jean Stéphane from an hotel room here at Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. See you in the next video.